Excellent. Okay. Good evening, everybody. I'm so glad you're on the call. We are talking about um, the whole lesson planning and scheduling aspect of designing your own curriculum. Um, things that we share tonight will still be helpful to some of you that pick a full program or pick a full program and tweak a little, but our main focus is going to be those of us who pull together our own curriculum from various sources and try to figure out um, how to make that work and how that fits into a school year or maybe whatever our school year looks like, since that can be different for everyone. So I'm glad you guys are here tonight. Um, we will share a little bit about what works um, for us and then ask, let you guys uh, do questions and answers. So if at any point you have something to say, drop it in the chat box, and then I'll give you guys a chance to unmute towards the end and ask questions and kind of share with us what it is that you need. But before we do all that, let us pray. It is the Feast of Pentecost, so we are going to ask the Holy Spirit to come upon our gathering and our chat tonight so that we can be inspired to teach our children whatever it is that they need to learn. So let's begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O oh God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Yay. I love our shared faith and that we can trust that there's a commonality that joins us. I was thinking about that today with Pentecost and the church's birthday and that we are all united at definitely not kind of it's definitely a beautiful thing um, so homeschooling when you're figuring it out um, as I said it is great if you want to go to a company and purchase their set curriculum for a school year for your kid and get their lesson plans and follow along with them that is a fantastic way to homeschool I'm totally serious I'm not saying that for a lot of families that is really it's already been done. People have tested it. People have done it. It works. Um, if you are listening to this call and feeling like that's a um, cop out or like being less, it's not. Totally not. Okay. Because I know sometimes those of us who design our own curriculum can make people feel that way. And I don't want you to feel that way. I want you to know that buying the box is totally okay. And I think you've kind of seen in my group the flavor is you've got to do what works for your family in this season of life. And that's going to look different than my family. And that's going to look different than your family next year or the year five years from now. Um, so please make sure that whatever you're doing and when you're getting different advice and different input, different suggestions, that you take that to prayer, that you take that to your heart and discern what's going to work for your family right now. Because you can always change it in the future. You're not stuck for 12 years, 13 years, I guess, technically, if you're K through 12. Um, it's one year at a time. And it's not even quite one year at a time because if you are totally hitting like meltdown in month two in October, it's okay to make some adjustments. But I just want to make sure that we say that up front, that if you're picking up a plan and you're like, I could do this, then do it. Make that work. But some of us are a little more type A and a little more controlling and a little more power hungry. <laughs> or we have really good reasons for wanting to adapt a curriculum to fit our family. Um, and so that's the key is what are the good reasons that you have? And we talked on our call yesterday, and that recording is on the YouTube channel, about designing your own curriculum and how you decide what do I teach each kid and how do I pull that together. So we're assuming tonight that you've done that part, that you've figured out which materials or programs or um, books to use in the process of teaching your kid next year, but you've got to figure out how to put it all together. That's, what, that's our starting point tonight. So I'm going to let Selena start and share with us what she does when she pulls that together. And I'm actually going to make you bigger for this one, because I know later I'm gonna have stuff I hold up. Let's see if I can get you nice and big. There you are. Hey, Selena. Hello. All right. So the, so the first two to three years that we homeschooled, we pulled our own materials together. Um, for us, the main reason was a budget reason. Uh, we couldn't afford a full curriculum. We really couldn't afford buying all those books all at once. It was just a financial stress for us. And that's why we made that decision for us for the first th 
two to three years. Um, I say two to three because my daughter repeated third grade to third grade age and we ended up going with a box curriculum at third grade. Um, we had the finances at the time, we could do it. But in those younger years, it really didn't seem like a wise financial investment for us to go all in with the program if we weren't sure we we're gonna stick with it. So instead, we pulled together programs, book lists and materials that either I could find resale or other people had used and had enjoyed and we put it all together. So I'm gonna ask Jenny, to share, do the screen share and yep. pull up the 2019 to 2020. It looks like a grid. It's not the daily, weekly not assignment. Not the weekly calendar, the schedule. Yeah. The Got schedule. it. See if I can do this technology. Can we see it? Can we see it? It's spinning. Okay. So this is what it looks like. If you can scroll up to oh, the top. Yeah, that's way down here. I think I was seeing what you got. Okay. So across the top, you can see those are the books that I chose for that year. This was last year's my daughter's first grade year. Those were the books that we found at half price books, resale. Some of them were gifts. Um, the American Tales one, that was a gift. The Egyptian mythology, that was a gift. The Magical Tales, Magical Animals, those were gifts. So these were st stories that had great messages, had great art, we wanted to read them. How I divide them up is based on the table of contents. The books that we chose were from the Modern Amabilis list and I break them up, I give myself some room. So you can see the dates, the dates go down on week one, they go all the way down to week 36. We have 36 weeks in our, in our school year and I just assign stories for that week. And I give myself some room, I give myself some space because those American tales, those were longer. So we read that one tale throughout the week. Um, the English fairy tales, those were shorter. She could read one a week with me, next to me. And those Aesop's fables, those were short. Those were a couple minutes long. So we could read one or two each day. But it really depends on the age of the child and the length of the story and what, how long they can sit down. And that, that varies per child, that varies per age. So you have to know your kid. You know, what stories are they interested in? What books do they want to read? Um, the three other titles, All About Reading, Faith in Life, and Story of Life Civilization, the, those um, had 50 lessons for All About Reading. So I did two lessons a week. Faith in Life and Story of Life Civilization, those have about 30 chapters. So we did one chapter a week. And we would just read it throughout the week. Um, if you can switch over to the other Excel spreadsheet, the weekly calendar. Yeah, that, that's the one thing I have to stop and then go back to the other one. Okay. Um, does, if, if you have any questions about how I set up the year, I really got my ideas from Sarah McKenzie's Teaching from Rest. She has in that, if it doesn't fit on a sheet of paper, it's probably not going to get done. <laughs> <laughs> and that's so true for me, um, especially for that. K, pre-K four to third grade. If it's not going to fit on a sheet of paper, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to flip through multiple things to what our day is going to look like. Um, if you can scroll down a little bit, Jenny, so they can see. So there, there we go. Okay. So this is what our day would look like. Um, I've taken away times now that my kids are older, but when they were younger and I needed structure, I assigned times, whatever works for your family. You can do blocks of work. You can schedule times doesn't really matter. Um, but this is sort of how I broke up the week for us. Um, and it gave my husband a little bit of peace knowing that we were hitting all the subjects that he cared about. He's the one who wanted me to homeschool. I didn't want to, but it gave us accountability both ways. Uh, so how I got my schedule was from the Modern Mobility site. They have a weekly schedule for pre-K, K, first grade, second where it shows you all the different subjects. So I took that schedule and plugged in what we were using for that subject and gave myself a block of time. Now we're not sitting there for the whole 30 minutes. She's maybe sitting there for 15 minutes at, a at first grade and we're giving her time to run up and down the stairs, do pull-ups, do push-ups because she's an aesthetic, athletic kind of child. Um, but that's how we structured our school days. I, this is, you know, what worked for us. And I'm happy to share these documents, but you have to find what works for you. 
this one was helpful for me because it showed me all the assignments we had to get through during the week and each day. So if I know I have stuff on my plate, I'm not going to schedule other things. Um, her math and her reading and her workbooks, she picked them out. She, she enjoyed them. We picked them out together. Um, her books, she really liked that we did this past year. So we went through that Modern Mobilis book list again. I might not use it for a third grade. I might. We don't know. So uh, you can go back to the regular screen. Okay. Her. Yeah, that's screen. So how I got that schedule was I looked in the front of all of our books and they all have a table of contents. So I just, sometimes the publisher has them listed so you can just copy and paste them from the website. Sometimes I had to type them. Um, but that's how I scheduled it. And if I can see from the span of that Excel spreadsheet, if it's going too wide or if it's going too far down, then that book's not gonna make the list. It's too much for the school year. And that's okay. If we get through 80% of our books, I'm happy. There was two books we didn't finish this uh, last year was Egyptian Mythology. We just didn't like the last couple of stories. They were kind of weird and we didn't get through them. Um, this year we're probably going to finish because we were quarantined the first eight weeks. So we did get through a lot um, because we were home. So, but I'm not allowed, to, um, I'm not against switching up. Uh, yes, I can link the book list. I'm not against switching up a book if it's something that she's not getting into. Um, and our favorite thing to do while I'm reading to her is she likes to sit in color. She's a girl, she likes to sit in color. My son, he's probably, now that he's in kindergarten, when I'm sitting and reading with him, he's doing stretches or he's doing squats. It's, he's a boy, but I'm fine with the wiggles. Um, I think that's all I had to share, Jenny, as far as organizing okay. the list. That's fantastic. No, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Does anyone, I'm gonna pause and let you, it, what, which book list are we talking? The Modern Mobilis. Oh, okay, Modern oh. Mobilis, okay. Yeah, and that's then, that's how I get my literature. Yeah. And then um, did anyone else um, want to see anything she showed or have quick questions about things that she showed before um, we move on? Because I know once we have that out of our brain, it might disappear. Whoops, what's happening? OK. Um, all right. If you guys think of something and you want to ask later, that's totally fine. I've got the website to Modern Mobilis because it's easy and memorized. That should work. Um, Modern Mobilis website is a little bit like you have to figure it out at first and go to like the part that says how to figure it out because it's developed based on an English woman's philosophy, which is different than American school system. So keep that in mind, but it's awesome to see those lists. Thank you, Selena. All right, I'm going to figure out how to move you down here and put myself back up. Hi, that worked. <laughs> um, and I will kind of tell you guys how I have done this over the years. So for us, planning happens, I mean, it has happened a little bit differently every year. I mean, I've definitely evolved my process. You know, the first year I'm just trying to pull it together, trying to figure it out and um, moving forward. So, um, but even from the beginning, I was someone who needed it. I need parameter, parameters and I need to know what I'm supposed to do, when I'm supposed to do it. And like Selena said, I have to have it in writing because my husband and I joke around that if it's not written down, it's not getting done. So, because it doesn't, it's just gone. And so it's funny when we joke about it, but the reality is like, if one of us doesn't see the other um, right, it down, then it's not going to get done. I mean, it's going to be forgotten. So there's that. He told me to do some, make a phone call tonight. And I was like, okay, I'll do that. And then he kind of gave me this look and I was like, I'm going to write it down right now. <laughs> okay. So that said, um, the first thing I have to do is figure out when we're going to homeschool. And I am going to see if I can pull up. Okay. So I'm going to highly, highly, highly recommend, and I'm going to dump the link now so that I don't forget this. Um, the planning forms that Pam Barnhill has, because she has forms that I think are super helpful, that are free, um, if you sign up for her mailing list, and then of course you can unsubscribe if you find her mailing list not helpful, but you'll still get the planning forms. And they're totally free. 
And um, I think it's a good place to start to kind of have some space and look at what is it that I need to do. Um, they are editable, I can't say that word, um, in Adobe. So like you can type your actual stuff in there, but I'm a pen and paper person and I love my erasable pens. So while Selena has her beautiful spreadsheet, I print out all these pages and write all over them. So I'll try to show you some of those, like I brought them, but um, I'll show you some of the blank pages first so you see what that looks like. So let me share that. Um, her really awesome free planning pages that you can get. There's 12 pages in all, and I'm just gonna kind of tell you the ones that I use when I'm starting out, um, my, figuring out my year. So obviously I'm gonna have a calendar. Um, this one's 2021, I haven't printed it yet, but it's there. And I'm gonna mark all over my calendar. So, I mean, I know I'm, my screen is really small right now because I'm highlighted, but let's see. So, oh, let's see. So like, I'm gonna cross out the month of July because we, we did not school in July this year. I'm gonna go in August and I'm gonna mark through the days and circle our start date. And this is gonna help me figure out how many days I'm gonna school. Some of you live in states where that's a requirement. Um, the normal requirement is 180 days of school. So I still kind of try to shoot for that, even though in Texas I don't have to have a number of days. But it helps me um, stick to something that Selena pointed out as well, is that we, I don't try to plan too much. Because especially when you're pulling together your own curriculum, I have not talked to a mom yet that's like, oh, I never plan too much. <laughs> like, I don't know who that is. Um, it's, I still do it. But it helps, and it helps me limit that. So like our school year this year, I had 172 days that I thought we would school. We take a lot of breaks during the year for various reasons. Um, for a long time, we did the, I guess it's called Sabbath schooling, where we would school for six or seven, it's supposed to be school six weeks and take the seventh week of rest. And we would school for like six or seven weeks, depending on where the holidays fell, and then take a whole week off. And when my kids were in elementary school, we all loved that. That week off was a time to go on field trips, do all the doctor's appointments. Um, I would just, I would take a um, teacher work day and I would catch up on anything that I hadn't done with the school stuff, order books for the next term or whatever it was. Um, as my kids got older and they were involved in co-ops and they were they're in middle school and high school classes, we haven't done as much taking a full week off, but we take off a lot of four day weekends. Um, well, this past year, um, my daughter is a competitive Irish dancer, and we were traveling probably once a month to a competition, and so that was like a four-day weekend, because we left on Friday, we came home Sunday, but we were shot, and we needed Monday to recover. So I counted all those days and crossed them out. So it, typical school year for us, we start on August 15th, the Feast of the Assumption, and we finish before my oldest son's birthday, which is June 22nd. So... Um, that's a typical school year for us for like the past probably four or five years. That's worked for us because of all the breaks that we take. It's longer kind of. Um, so that's the first thing I do. I say most years because this year, since we were quarantined and everything was canceled and we stayed home, we just finished last Friday. We finished early because it was like, I guess we're done. <laughs> um, so that was nice. Then, um, Let's see, I stopped share so I can get a different one. So then the next step I do once I figure out when I'm going to school throughout the year is I look at my week and I look at what is going to happen in my week. And there's a page for that. I should have stayed sharing because I can click on this link. Maybe if my internet's going to let me. Oh, no. Okay. There it goes. That one? Yeah. So I pick out the, a weekly plan and you can use PAMS or you can make your own or you can print these free on the internet wherever you find them. But I think it's important to have a weekly plan. And one of the reasons why is because you have to first put in all the stuff that you have to do during the week. You need to block out time to eat <laughs> You need to and cook. You need to block out time when your kids act activities out of the house or you have therapy appointments or whatever it might be. You have to if you're joining a co-op, if you're in some kind of lessons, that has to be blocked out first before you can plug in your lessons or you're gonna to plan too much and you're gonna be overwhelmed and you're never gonna get it all done. I think Sarah McKinsey calls it budgeting your time and I know Pam talks about it in her plan your yearbook as well, is that you would never like decide, oh, I'm buying this million dollar house without having a million dollars. So if you take this stack of books and you're like, we're gonna do all the things, but you don't know how much time you have, then you're going to flop. So I do that. Um, I have her old one here. I just print it out and I, I fill in the stuff that is going to take up time. Um, you can change the times on this too. It's really cool. You can do however you want. 
but I think that's important to see. And then I figure out, well, what are our school hours each day? And how many hours do we have? And then that will help me when I sit down to work with what, how long each kid is going to spend on each thing to figure out, is there, are there enough hours in the day? Because probably there aren't, and I'm going to have to get creative, and I'm going to have to change materials. We talked on yesterday's call about being idealist, and that's totally in my wheelhouse that I'm just like, oh, I want to do all the things that are just my ideal. But the reality is my ideal requires a whole lot more time and a whole lot more mommy one-on-one -on -one than I have. I just don't have that ability. So I'm going to each year kind of pick something, a few things to do the ideal. And then I'm going to have to fill in with other stuff that my kids might be able to do independently or, or on a video, or I'm going to skip it that year because limited time. Okay. So then once I do that, let's see if I even have, yeah. So this is one of my favorite pages that she has is a course of study. And um, this is what, something we talked about yesterday, but I wanted to show the visual that we list all the subjects we want our kids to learn. And then we list like a schedule for what that's going to be like. Um, and since you've seen that, I'll stop sharing so I can hold up my stuff. Um, so the first thing I do, of course, in all those subject areas, again, we've, we're past this point, but is figure out which materials I'm going to use. So I'm listing down the side, you know, the four R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, and religion. And then I'm adding the science and the history and maybe some art and music or what's on here. Um, spelling and vocabulary, foreign language for my big kids. Um, what else? Handwriting, character, education, uh, composition. So I'm adding, I'm listing the subjects and listing what materials we're going to use. And then this is, I joked yesterday that it's a lot of math. What works best for me is then to figure out this is the material I'm using. Let's use a first grade example. So this is the material I'm using for handwriting. I have a handwriting without tears book. It's just a book, you know, however many pages, I think they're like 90 something pages long. Am I gonna have them do one a day? And then that's 90 something pages and then we'll be done long before with the 180 or my 172 days of school is up. Or can I do maybe twice a week or three times a week or four times a week? Um, that's what I look at. And I said this year that my first grader could do handwriting four days a week because it only is going to take him like 10 minutes and then he'll finish the whole book in a year. So that's how I did that math. That was an easy one. Um, literature might be harder. Selena talked to that though. You know, you get the book, you look at the table of contents or the number of chapters or the number of pages and you figure out how can I divide this up? How much am I really asking my kid to read each day? especially as they get older, each kid is going to have a different ability to read independently um, for time. So like one kid might be only able to read like five pages without going nuts and or without forgetting all of it is more important, right? And so they have to read five pages a day. But now my junior in high school can read 20 pages, no problem. So she can read the same amount of stuff and only do it two days a week or Maybe she can read double the amount of stuff and do it every day. So you also have to know based on what the material is, how, how long it's going to take and how many times a week they need to do it. Um, I think the biggest thing transitioning from a, a brick and mortar school to homeschooling is that um, it doesn't have to look like school at home. It doesn't have to look the same. You don't have to do, you know, 30 minutes or 50 minutes of math and 50 minutes of this and 50 minutes of this. You can spread it out however is going to work best for your family. A lot of families will block schedule and they'll say, you know what, we're going to do history on Mondays and Tuesdays and science on Wednesdays and Thursdays and Friday we'll do music. And so that's going to take up a big chunk of their time, maybe 45 minutes, depending on the age, but they're not doing it every single day in little chunks. So some subjects work better for every day and some subjects don't. So back to my first grader. So this year it was handwriting four times a week, literature, I ended up making everything four times a week for him. Literature, math, reading, and religion. He had, he's first grade. I was not concerned about him and he was gonna be around while I was schooling his third grade brother. So I could just give him these little chunks. And so that first grader didn't need, I didn't need to write down, oh, we're gonna do page one on the first day and two on the second day and three on the next day. We could just do the next thing once I'd figured out what we're gonna do. So I posted this in the group previously and now it's hiding from me, hold on. But for him, I make a, there it is, a block um, schedule that just has 
each subject that he does each day with a picture of the book that we're going to use. Now, I copied and pasted these pictures off the internet into a Word document where I made a table. So this was not that complicated. And I was able to change it when we finished a book and could move on to something else. But he loved this and I put it in a page protector and he could get a dry erase marker and check off the boxes each day that we did it. I also gave him a four day work week because I knew I could and that was okay. Um, but my, he loves having this because he knows this is what he gets to do. But I don't have to spend as much time to say, do the next math page. I mean, we just do the next math page, right? But when my kids get older, I spend a lot more time calculating things out so that I can enter their lesson plans into a program I use called myschoolyear.com. Um, and I'm going to do a whole little tutorial on myschoolyear.com because I think it's so helpful for especially middle school and high school. Um, but I did use it for the first time this year with my third grader, and he was totally thrilled um, that he had his own list. Yes, Anna, I'll, Anna, I'll share that table um, again. The program that I use, basically, I sit down at the beginning of the school year in the summer. I spend a chunk of time in the summer planning this, and that is one thing that's the reality, and I think Selena would agree with me, and I'm sure Deanna and all of y'all would agree with me. The time you sit down in the summer and plan and figure things out makes the school year go much more smoothly. Um, we don't have time. Nobody has time to do it. You just figure it out and squeeze it in and put the kids in front of a movie way too often. But to spend the time and sit down and map all this out does make it easier to go to the next thing throughout the school year because you don't have to think so much. Um, Sarah McKenzie calls it decision fatigue. We have so many decisions we have to make as moms. Um, that if you just make all those decisions up front and just follow your decisions, then it's less stressful. But what I do for my bigger kids is I will, well, this is my sophomore or my freshman. So I guess I didn't bring the, um, the third graders, which would be more realistic for those of you with little kids. Um, but I'm able to go into the program and I'm able to type, create classes and I'm able to type in um, how many chapters are in that book and how long I want them to finish, when I want them to finish, or and how many days a week I want them to read it. And it calculates for me how many pages they need to read each day to get done whenever I say. So it's a really great tool, and then it's all there. So like when I need to go back to it in high school or later making transcripts or looking at middle school to say, what did we do last year? It's all there for me. So an example is this was my son's history reading. Let's see, and I can screenshot some, some of these later. Um, and he's reading a bunch of different books, but for him, just ignore the dates. I'll explain that in a minute. But so it tells him that week he has to read chapters five through eight, then nine through 12. Then he's going to switch. Um, then he's going to read the epilogue and switch to another book and another book. There's three books on here. So it tells him and he can take this and go do his work without talking to me, <laughs> which he loves. <laughs> and I'm, I have mixed feelings about. Um, if it's a, I do a lot of home, the recorded homeschool connection classes for my older kids. Um, if it's that kind of thing, it just says that week, do class three, class four, class five, class six, class seven. Um, and he knows that. His spelling book, that week he had to do 102 to 104, which is three lessons. And he, my high schoolers get to choose when they do what. They make their own week plan every Monday as to what schoolwork they're gonna do, because I want them to practice planning that out and figuring out how much they can do in a day and how to spread out their work. And I don't care if they do all the history on Monday and all the math on Tuesday, I don't like them to do all the math in one day because then I have to grade it um, in between them doing it. But I try to give them a lot of flexibility in scheduling their own um, days so that they can uh, have more control of that and learn that life skill of time management. But those lists were helpful for my son as well. Um, my third grader is what I mean, because he, again, could take those. And there were things that he knew, knows he can do independently. So if he's waiting on me to do something. He can just look at that and it's all spelled out. How do I get to that point? So backing up just a second, um, different books, like we said, have different, you know, they have a lesson number or they have chapters or page numbers. Some books we use, like our science says in the beginning of the book, um, exactly what to do for 36 weeks because it's designed for homeschoolers. And I just, you know, type that in and so that I have a guide for it. 
um, 36 weeks is 180 days if you do five days a week. That's the math there for those of us who don't have to do a certain number of days. Um, but for those big kids, I am literally counting out minutes um, because I found, again, that I just lean towards giving them too much. And so somewhere in middle school, when it starts to get hectic and stuff starts to matter, I write out how many hours a week I think they should be doing school based on our schedule. And I look at how many minutes that is. And then I take the materials that I chose and figure out approximately how long it's gonna take them to do one lesson or one thing. And then I count up the number of minutes that I think the books are gonna take each week. And then I look at that based on the number of minutes that we have available and make sure that it matches. Um, because I don't want my kids to be overwhelmed. And when I say matches, for example, this is my daughter's eighth grade year. Um, her available, this is not a good example. <laughs> Okay, well, this is a bad example where her available minutes were 975 minutes in one week. And I literally scheduled her for 975 minutes in one week. Um, I would not necessarily recommend that again <laughs> um, as I pick that up. But like my son, um, oh, I did calculate this out. My son's year, I wrote it down, was um, 858 minutes. Um, and we had available like, what does this say? Over a thousand minutes. So I gave him buffer. Um, and that's another thing that Sarah McKenzie says is to plan 80% of your time and leave 20% for buffer. So if you have an hour to work on school before you have to go to an appointment, you're only going to spend, you're only going to plan 80% of that because the baby's going to interrupt and the doorbell's going to ring and someone's going to need to go to the bathroom or something. Um, so that's, you know, I get really meticulous when my kids are older, as far as minutes and so forth goes. When they're a little bit younger, it's just more about, okay, I think this is going to take us this amount of time. Um, do I have that amount of time in the day to get that done? Um, because I think that's kind of where it's easy to flop in making your own curriculum. Let me look at my notes to make sure I didn't forget anything I wanted to say. Um, oh, the other thing that's really helpful is procedure lists. Um, if you have a program that, uh, a material that you're using where you kind of do the same thing every day, like every time you pick it up, um, but it's not obvious. So I'm thinking like Story of Civilization might be a good example. Um, that's a history program from Tan Homeschool. And it has, if you get the kit, it has a textbook or audiobook. It's the same content, but you can read it or listen to it. You can have um, the textbook, there is an activity book, there is a test book, and there are DVD videos or, or streaming videos. So I might look at that and say, okay, I need a procedure list for this. And I know Amy, who's been on our calls, has a procedure list for Story of Civilization, which is what made me think of it. And she has it written down that on Monday, they read or listen to the chapter. On Tuesday, they do the map and one coloring page. You have that too, Selena? On Wednesday, they do whatever it is, whatever order that she puts it. And she has that written down on a procedure list in her teacher binder so that she doesn't have to think about it. Just think, what are we doing now? What day is it? It's just, okay, it's Wednesday, we watch the video. Oh, it's Thursday, my older kids take the test. And so she has that already planned out, but it doesn't have to be like written on her planner every week, copied over and over if you're handwriting it, because that can be overwhelming. So I wanted to make sure to mention procedure lists. And then the last thing I wanted to mention, yes, Sarah McKenzie's book is Teaching from Rest, and we're going to do a study on it in a couple, a week or two. Um, fabulous, fabulous book. Can't recommend it enough. Te uh, Teaching from Rest, A Homeschooler's Guide to Unshakable Peace. Um, the last thing is loop scheduling. Another tool that I've used sometimes when life is especially chaotic or I have a lot I want to include and I don't want to miss anything is I will have a block on my schedule for looping and I will take a couple of subjects that usually the extras, the stuff we wouldn't otherwise get to, um, but it might be science or math or something to that. And I will list a loop and I'm trying to figure out how to explain this. Basically I'll put the names of the, of the books or the lessons 
that I want to accomplish, even if I'm, stuff that I'm not gonna do every single day. And then on each day, when it's time for our looping time, I look at the list and I do what's next. So Monday, I might do the first and second thing. Tuesday, I might just get the third thing done. Wednesday, we got the fourth thing done and we had extra time, so we went back and started over and did the first thing again. So I'm never gonna miss anything. People do this with their chores too, by the way, which is cleaning house, which is very, Selena, yeah, very helpful because you know, if you say every Monday I'm cleaning the bathroom and every Tuesday I'm cleaning the kitchen, what happens if you're sick Monday? Do you ever, is the bathroom wait till the next Monday? <laughs> so if you have a loop, like with, for school subjects, you're always gonna do the next thing on the list and you're always gonna hit everything. But um, personally, I can only use loops effectively on the subjects that it's okay if we don't finish it by the end of the year or it's not crucial. Um, because I am going to kind of make that my back burner thing, but the math and the religion and the reading and the writing have to happen consistently um, or, or we're not going to get through, you know, the skill base that I want my kids to get through. Now, almost everything that I've just shared is in Pam's planner yearbook. So she has a book, where's the, where's the homeschooling planning for purpose and peace. Um, that's fabulous. And I, the link that I dropped in the chat, if you sign up for her free planning pages, she then tells you all about her book in the next, you know, web page, all about her book, all about her course. Um, if you order it through her website, you get a ton of more planning pages in addition to the free ones that I showed you, um, as well as access to some other things. The link that I dropped is my affiliate link. So if you like what I'm doing and you want to support me, um, that link in the chat is uh, my affiliate for her, but um, she has everything in here that we've talked about, um, starting with vision and goals, creating schedules. She's got block schedules, loop schedules, weekly plans, daily plans, lesson plan lists, procedure forms, um, planning your own study, organizing your materials, periodic reviews. Um, so she is uh, kind of, I was doing a lot of this before she wrote it, but now that she's done it, I'm like, oh, I can just follow the book. I don't have to remember. <laughs> um, so I highly, highly, highly recommend what she has. She has an online course where she'll walk you through it and she's so encouraging and kind and sweet to tell you how to do all these things. Um, but she kind of does this framework like I've talked about. Um, she doesn't get into the nitty gritty of like counting hours like I just did, um, because I think that's something that each family has to figure out what, well, how much time they can spend on school and what that's gonna look like. Um, but I recommend that. So I've got that link in the um, chat. What else is in the chat? The table for my son. Yes, I shared it in the group a while ago under one of the scheduling posts, but I can snapshot another picture and post it up there. Um, my kids ate cereal all day when you plan. Yes. I'm fortunate that my husband understands the, that whatever planning I do in the summer is hugely beneficial to our family over the school year. So he will let me go to the library by myself. like. Two, it's like two, three, four Saturday mornings in the summer so that I can just plow through it and really get it all mapped out because it helps me so much and gives me so much peace. Um, so let's type in Teaching from Rest by Sarah McKenzie. That is her, um, that is her homeschooling book. She um, also has the Read Aloud Revival book and she's, her business is the Read Aloud, Read Aloud Revival but she wrote this book, Teaching from Rust, specifically for homeschoolers, and it's a huge gift, and we'll be talking about it um, in the group in the coming weeks. Phew. Okay. I'm sure I forgot something, but I am going to take off me and look at all of your lovely faces and see what questions you guys have for Selena and me or things that you do in your homeschool that you want to share with us that for your planning. What do you want? to ask or share, so many things. Selena, I know you were like nodding and pointing a lot. Did you wanna piggyback off anything? Okay. All right, so what do you guys think you're going to, like what's one thing you heard that you need to do maybe that you haven't done before? I'm really curious, because it's gonna be different for everybody. Maybe Selena said something or I said something that you are like, oh, I need to do that.
Anna, yeah. Well, um, you know, when you mentioned um, making sure that you have all of your materials selected, you know, before you, that, that's a big deal, right? And so um, I'm glad I'm starting to do this now because I know the, you know, the fall or August will be here before we know it. Um, so as soon as we finish all this, I'm going to start, you know, looking at, looking at some of these um, resources that you've shared with us, but for sure, just having all your materials selected. Um, and I've been looking and I have, you know, a good idea of what I want to do, but I need, I need to decide. So that was really helpful knowing yeah. that, you know, you have to have that done first. Right? Yes, you really do. Um, yeah. You can, you can have it, you have to have decided if you can't purchase everything right away, that's sometimes okay if you can find a table of contents on the internet or you can know how the book is set up and you can borrow somebody's to look at or something. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't, it's ideal to have all of the things in front of you, but right. if you don't, you have to at least have selected them. And a couple of you've mentioned, and I don't know if it was today or in yesterday's um, Zoom, but um, purchasing used books or used resources, uh, where, where would you even go about starting that or finding those things? We have a whole wonderful thread in the group that I will find and tag you on all the different like resale places that people have found helpful. Um, okay. There's tons of them. I guess the first thing I would say is that if it's a specific material you know you want used, um, there are actually uh, Facebook groups completely devoted to particular curriculums resale. Oh, wow. So like my math program has an entire Facebook group devoted to people who want to resell that math program. Wow. So if you search okay. for that, you might find it. Okay. Um, yeah. And then there are some bigger like Catholic swap groups that are really great because they kind of have a variety of, of materials and, you know, they'll have a lot of the Catholic stuff that you wouldn't necessarily find in a specific group. But I will definitely... Um, writing it down to tag you <laughs> in that post so that you can see it. And then and that'll bump it for everybody else too. So. Okay. And hopefully here in my hometown, um, I'm sure there's some kind of, there's a huge homeschooling community here. So I'm sure I'll, I'm going to ask about connecting to maybe some of those swaps like you mentioned or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And um, Half Price Books does have homeschooling books. They have an education section and we've found some things there that are really helpful in person. Um, but most of my used shopping for curriculum is done online. You know, so, excellent question. Selena. And I would say that for literature, for books, standalone books, resale is great. I have not had good success with resale for workbooks. They're either somewhat damaged or written in and I don't recommend it, especially with younger children, because that can easily distract them. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. I am. Let's see, Maria, did you have something to add? It worked. There was something in the chat. I saw something about scheduling two yes. kids. Yes. Okay. So I just dumped for whoever asked in the chat, I just dumped the, a PDF of that, my son's picture schedule, this thing. So I just dumped that in the chat. I deleted his name. So you don't have to feel like that. Um, and so you can see what that looks like and use that if you want to. How best to plan two kids that need mom help. A second grader can read well and is pretty independent, but still needs guidance. I would like to start letter and number recognition with four-year-old. Yes. Um, I will give my opinion and I will let anyone else pop in to give theirs. My opinion is that your four-year-old um, can do that like 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes later in the day with you um, playing games or doing whatever. And then if you can teach your four-year-old how to occupy themselves if they don't already know or find some activity that they really love, your second grader should um, you know, really only take a couple hours. And so I would devote your time to that second grader um, as best as you can to do that. But a four-year-old that, you know, you're just working on letters and numbers is like a little bit each day. And I believe that a little bit each day is better than spending a long amount of time, like periodically. Um, so that's why I would recommend that. Other thoughts? Hey, that's exactly what I would do. I would assign mathematics and handwriting to the second grader 
and during that block of time, work one-on-one -on -one with a four-year-old. That's what I did this past year. And that attention, that love, one-on-one -on -one time with a four-year-old, sufficed them enough, and they felt loved, they could go on, so I could do writing and reading with a second grader. Yep, you're welcome. I have a quick question. Yeah. Hopefully it's quick because I'm thinking there might be something already on our Facebook page about homeschool conferences. Just thinking about curriculum and seeing it and touching it and looking through it. Mm -hmm. Is there anything going on this year with this? Like, no. Okay. <laughs> so not. all of the homeschool conferences that I am aware of um, live in person have been canceled. Yeah. Um, there's not going to be an opportunity this summer to go anywhere and pick up stuff that I can that I know of and I'm kind of know most of them. I, I know, I know all the big ones. I will say that there was, um, there already was an online um, convention, I can't think of the word, um, that was done in early April, I wanna say, by Great Homeschool Conventions. And they mm -hmm. still have a lot of those materials up on their website um, and some information from vendors. But there is going to be a Catholic virtual homeschooling conference, June 24th, no, 20, yeah, I don't know, the last weekend in June. <laughs> it will be um, announced tomorrow and registration will open this week. It will be free and it will be um, three days of fantastic speakers and vendors sharing their materials, um, TED Talk style. So they will be short and quick and concise. And there will also be opportunities in a unique Facebook group to ask questions and do Q and A with the vendors and speakers, um, I guess the week afterwards. But as far as I understand, um, the vendors who are coming, um, who are mostly Catholic um, curriculum, homeschool curriculum providers, are going to be very much available to answer questions and show their books um, in various ways throughout the weekend and the week to follow. So look for that and uh, um, and the vendors really want to sell you their books. So if you have questions about material, call them or mm -hmm. message them. Um, in my experience, anytime I've given a publisher a phone call, they direct me to a person who basically wrote the book <laughs> and can tell me anything I want to know. And they can send me extra sample pages and things like that. Selena? I, I have found um, some publishers that allow homeschoolers to unbox their materials on YouTube. So Mother Divine Grace, Catholic Heritage, Seton Moms, they're on YouTube. They call it their unboxing day and they open their books and show their spelling books and their grammar books and their math books. And you can see the artwork inside. You can see how thick the books are. You can see if they're bound or spiral bound. Um, so that's another way I chose Catholic Heritage was looking on YouTube and watching them unbox their materials. That's awesome. Yes, I've heard of that. I haven't watched them though. Now I need to. Super suggestion. I, um, it was, I, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Deanna. When I first started out, um, I had other homeschool moms in the area and I would just ask to see their books. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I got to see several different varieties from the different moms and, and touch them and feel them and see uh, the, you know, the spacing of the words and if I like that. So that was helpful too, if you can find a mom in the area to do that with. Yes. And in some of the larger areas, I know that um, I, in previous years, have hosted curriculum shares in various venues um, where I have everybody bring their books and we all sit down together and everybody gets to look through their favorite, you know, they don't bring all of their books, they bring like their favorites. And then the people who come get to look through them, we pass them around and flip through them that way. So that is, yeah, just getting to see stuff. Local uh, moms are a good resource. Also, various areas have homeschool stores. Um, we have two in the area here in Dallas-Fort Worth that I know of. Well, on the Fort Worth side, I don't know Dallas. The Fort Worth side, we have two. Um, they're Protestants and not, you know, they're not going to have the Catholic materials that, um, that are harder to get your hands on, but they have, you know, all the math stuff and all the science stuff that I can flip through. Great questions and ideas. Anything else from you guys?
Okay. Well, I just can't um, reiterate enough that if you want to have a successful homeschool year and you want it to go smoothly and you don't want to feel stressed out, sit down or do it standing if you have to while rocking a baby <laughs> and think through and jot down all of your plans for the year. And whether that is down to the nitty gritty of which page you're reading on which day, or if it's more like, okay, we're going to do lesson one this week and two this week. Um, the more detail you write down or the more plans you make, A, the, the less stress it is during the year itself when you're actually trying to implement those plans. And B, the more likely your plans are going to be realistic. I know I've kind of harped on that and the time involved, but um, I just really do think that that's one of the things that makes moms feel so overwhelmed and so burned out when they're homeschooling is that they're trying to do too much. They actually really are. Um, we have a finite amount of energy and time. And so it's important to consider that and choose accordingly and make those tough choices where, you know, there may be a year where I'm not going to pick the program I really want to use because it's going to take too much time. It, um, and then the next year I might be able to use that program and drop off something else. But um, it's really important to think through the time factor and how that, what that's going to look like. And then also to remember, it doesn't necessarily have to look like school at home. You can homeschool in the evenings and weekends. You can homeschool all year round. You can homeschool, you know, only three days a week and just to go all day hard, you know, hardcore. Um, Cause working families that do that, you know, working moms that do that um, different situations. So keep that in mind as well, where, um, Homeschooling includes everything that your family is doing, not just sitting at the table doing school, right? So like the example with the four-year-old and the letters and numbers, like you could probably actually do a lot of that without ever planning to, if you're just thinking about it and you're like, okay, every time we see letters, I'm going to be like, hey, what's this? Let's look at this letter here on the first, you know, at this book in there. Because um, they're learning all day long, whether, whether we are teaching them or not. That's just the way kids are. They're learning something. and so making their environment and, you know, making it in such a way that they feel free to learn is important too. Like Selena said, bouncing on the floor, doing squats and push-ups, and, you know, my kids play Legos and your kids color. And that's all very good too, because the brain needs positive vibes to be able to learn effectively. And as soon as they get upset, they're not learning. It's just, it's a futile effort. So figuring out what um, standards you can you you need to have because there has to be some expectation of you know cooperation and listening and quiet but um you know think outside the box this has been awesome to chat with you ladies anything else for question to close? yeah go ahead i don't know if this is related to lesson planning but i know that sometimes we plan for something and it doesn't happen mm -hmm. so as far as um recording or yeah, recording what actually happened. Are you doing that in this on the same um, template or, or sheet of paper or whatever, or you have something separate for that? To kind That's of an excellent question. You go first, Selena. Yeah, so that first spreadsheet I showed that had the 36 weeks and the books across, I just, with a, Add a column. green or pink color I have, I just cross it, cross it off. And as we read it, we cross it off. So we've crossed off all through I had planned this year through August because we're at home and there was nothing to do. So we, our school year is different than Jenny's. We start our school year in late May and we end our school year in January. We take off big break for Lent and Easter. That's our big break. Um, Cause that's when the weather's beautiful in Austin. That's when there are all the fun things we're to do. And so here we are and we're almost done. But yeah, that's what I yeah, just, print out my year long sheet and I cross it off. So, and I don't schedule different book lists for my kindergartner and my second grader. They're reading the same stories. They're listening at the same time. They're all doing the same history together. They have separate books for skill level work, but we're reading the same stories and we're listening to the same books and we're fostering conversations for lunch and for dinner. Awesome. Yeah. And I, um, for my older kids, kind of the fourth, whatever grade at third grade and up when I have it in my school year in my um, the platform online, it you check off when it's done. 
So I would take my kids, my kids take their sheet and they check it off. And then they turn this in at the end of the week and I go into the computer and I click what they actually did. Um, my program has a fancy feature that reschedule. So if we don't get it all done that week and I just click the reschedule button, it'll push everything one day, like say we were sick a day, it will push everything further. And I can keep an eye on that and see, um, make sure it's not gonna go beyond our, the end of our school year. Cause I plan buffer in there for the sick days and the things that we aren't gonna get done. Um, for my younger kids, I don't really keep track because I don't have to in Texas. So I know that we got done with books. I, I know that they did math. I, you know, anything under about fourth or fifth grade, I don't have to keep and don't, Feel like I need to. Um, I know some families that will do uh, reverse planning and so they just like especially if you have just like textbooks that you're using or books that are very clear that are like lesson one, lesson two, lesson three, um, they'll wait to write down each day what they did do and so they keep like a journal of the learning that they did and those families often are putting in that learning journal different things that they weren't intending to do but you can you know, something happens and you're like, oh, let's go look that up. Or, oh, let's go watch the NASA launch, right? And then you're like, oh, I'm putting that in there. We watched the NASA launch. And then we went to this website and learned about this. Um, so that's helpful as well if you want to keep track. Um, and I meant to say with all this planning and, you know, Jelena has her pretty spreadsheet and I use this program. I'll drop the link in the group chat in a second. Um, but the simplest way to plan if you can't plan too far ahead or if you need to give your kids a list, a daily list, and you don't want to just tediously put all that in in the summer, um, as long as you have kind of a framework and you know how often they're going to do stuff and that you're going to have enough time, um, because Sarah McKenzie has a post on spiral notebooks. And if you just grab a spiral notebook and the night before you make a to-do list for the next day, and that's your guide for that school day. That is the sim a simple way to do it that's still very effective. The benefits of that is you can change it. So it's not like locked in where, oh, this is what we're supposed to do on Tuesday. And then you realize, wait, we have an unexpected doctor's appointment, so I have to cross out three things. You can just write on there. Um, and she also writes things on there that are not necessarily school, but she doesn't want her kids to forget, like today you need to clean your room or you need to do this piano practice or something. Um, so that's an easy way to give your kids a list and it takes like five minutes the night before to you know jot down um and then those people can cross that off and they just have a record of what they did let's see the program is fly school year.com and i will be doing oh that went private let me make it go public i will be doing a um video to demonstrate how i use my school year.com um, that I'll just be a recording and I'll post probably this definitely this week, but in the next few days So you guys can see if that's something you might want to do. It's pretty affordable It's run by a Catholic homeschooling family that I know personally um, So I really like that I can support them, but it's it's fantastic Like they add so many features all the time that I'm like, whoa um, And there's a referral program if you put that I recommended it. I get a month free. So <laughs> thanks Good questions, you guys are awesome. Anything else? We're good, we're good. All right, I know it's Sunday night. Whew, the week coming. I'm so glad you ladies joined us. Thank you so much. We, um, this is kind of the last call for now that I have scheduled. We had a lot of calls in April and May. Um, and right now we're gonna kind of keep talking about all these things in the group, but also um, switch to kind of a more holistic view of homeschooling and talk about teaching from rest and a few other things that I think help guide our decisions and help lead us through planning. And we'll do some um, planning workshops as well that if you need one, you know, like help and we want to sit down on a call and chit chat about what you are trying to figure out, we will do some of those like uh, troubleshooting brainstorming sessions in the coming months as well. So thanks for joining me tonight.